Welcome to episode three. Uh, so we've talked about what is Web3, what is a blockchain. So now we'll look at what are the popular blockchains out there that you will see out there when you are going through your journey of Web3. The three we'll talk about today is Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana. So let's start with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the godfather of crypto. It's the reason we're all here talking about Web3, tokens, smart contracts, all of these things, because largely they, it's the foundations to how we can operate with decentralized money, decentralized finance, and all those great things that we'll go into more of the, in this course. It's, it took a lot of different concepts uh, in cryptography and finance and put it together into what we know now as crypto. It was created in 2008 by a white paper famously Satoshi Nakamoto, which uh, no one knows who exactly it is. And a white paper, in case you're not familiar with the concept, is really kind of a part technical, part philosophical approach uh, to explain what the concept is, how it might it work if it wasn't implemented, um, and even giving some guidance to engineers and developers on how they would maybe want to implement this. So that's what the first white paper and for Bitcoin was describing. But first, after the uh, paper was published, then it took some time for it to actually get implemented. So the first block of Bitcoin, the Genesis block, as we described in the last episode, was actually mined in 2009. And it actually follows a proof of work consensus model. We'll, we'll talk about consensus next in the next episode in more depth. But just know that what proof of work means is that each time a node adds a block to the blockchain, it needs to actually perform some sort of computation. And that's the work in the proof of work. The transaction time is 10 minutes. So anytime you want to send any uh, funds or tokens to another account, roughly it takes 10 minutes to confirm and the, for that transaction to be added to a block and, and ver verified and validated. The block size is limited to one megabyte. So that means one megabyte of data in each block. And largely people say this is by design, that uh, Satoshi designed this to uh, make it sort of an anti-spam filter where you know one couldn't control the entire throughput of the network by putting in spam transactions. So if we limit the block size to one megabyte, uh, we can move on and add new blocks later. But that's currently where the uh, restrictions are for Bitcoin. The next blockchain that we'll talk about is Ethereum. So Ethereum was really kind of the birth of dApps or decentralized applications. These are essentially applications that instead of using a database uh, for holding records and information, uh, they use the blockchain. And this is actually done through what we call the Ethereum virtual machine or the EVM. So instead of just having uh, all the nodes run trend or keep a ledger as far as uh, the transactions, it can also run code. Uh, and this is where we get a lot of the smart contracts where without allowing self-executing code on the blockchain. And we'll go into way more details about that in other number of sessions. But you know, this Ethereum was created in 2013, again by a, a white paper by Vitalik. And the Genesis block was in July, 2015. There's some great uh, books and documentaries about the birth of Ethereum that I highly recommend as it is a what we call a, a lot more of a stable network now, but there was ups and downs. So it's a very interesting story to, to check out. With Ethereum, it, it's currently in the consensus model of proof of work, but maybe by the time you're watching this video, we have transitioned to proof of stake. Uh, the, the merge as it's called or the upgrade to Ethereum 2 allows a proof of stake model where instead of allowing for comp computation being the reward, it's actually a stake or the amount of the, the, the node participates in uh, as far as holding the amount of Ethereum. So it's important because there's been a lot of pressures from uh, Ethereum, both on the environmental impact of allow having to require all this computational energy and as well as speed, which proof of stake is promising uh, to at least help with both of those areas. So it's a super exciting time. And again, uh, you know, it's been talked about and planned about almost initially when uh, Ethereum was mo uh, started, uh, but now it's getting very close. So uh, hopefully now Ethereum will move to the proof of stake model. 
Uh, the transaction time is around 15 seconds to five minutes, and this is really based on network throughput. So if uh, at times of busy network, uh, the transaction times tend to go higher, um, and that's you know geared towards the amount of transactions that are kind of fighting for it to get into the block. There have been improvements on uh, Ethereum as far as being able to decide on which transactions are getting in there and how to reward the miners or validators of those transactions. And I think that's an interesting point we'll talk about. And also the block size limit is 30 million gas. So there's not uh, actually a, a data size as it's uh, pertained to other blockchains, but there's this concept called gas within Ethereum basically meaning every operation that happens, uh, whether it's a transfer, so transferring funds, or different other uh, operations that are in the smart contracts, have a signed amount of gas that it takes to compute. So for each block, there's just a basically a signed amount of operations each block is able to compute. So you, again, based on the contracts or the code that's within the blocks or the transaction, that's what determines the block size limit. And lastly, I want to talk about the Ethereum improvement pr proposals, so EIPs. Again, one of the big selling points and benefits of working with, in, on Ethereum is that it has this mechanism to actually improve itself as a community. So anyone can make a proposal basically either on the kind of structural or the way that Ethereum works, or even kind of even smaller things that don't necessarily require technical implementation, like different naming, or uh, ways that things are, are assigned. And anyone can make these proposals. They get voted on them by the, uh, first by, and discussed by the community. And then a sort of group of people are tied to the Ethereum Foundation, as well as other individuals in the community are able to vote or approve of, of those proposals. And then they get implemented by the core team. So this again, really talking about not only the decentralization of Web3 on a transaction level, on a technical level, but the decentralization of uh, Web3 on a actual governance or improvement level where, uh, again, anyone can make an improvement to the network uh, and make this more of a resilient and scalable network, which is really kind of uh, the main goal for any blockchain. The next network we'll look at, the next blockchain is Solana. Solana is known as the high performance blockchain. It's probably the one of the fastest blockchains out there, as we'll see later in the transaction times. Uh, and it's brought a lot of different use cases because now we don't need to wait to process transactions as long uh, as you know in Bitcoin or Ethereum based on traffic. It was created in 2017 by Anatoly. And the Genesis block uh, was actually mined March 16th of 2020. It takes uh, a hybrid approach of the consensus of proof of stake and proof of history. Again, we'll talk about consensus models more in depth, but proof of history is basically allowing us to utilize the timestamp of these transactions to be verified so that we know that if each, if the time set is correct, it's also a valid transaction. And speaking of time, the transaction time is around five to 20 seconds, which is actually very close or even better than some credit card processing transactions. So again, it brings us to different use cases and abilities that we haven't seen in the world of crypto and Web3 before. The lock size limit is 10 megabytes, so again, significantly higher than uh, in Bitcoin. And it's also significantly cheaper to transact uh, currently, at least uh, compared to the Ethereum network, where transaction times are very fluctuating or changing by the time of the amount of traffic that is in the network. This may change as more volume and traffic hits the Solana network, but that's yet to be seen. And, you know, it sounds really great. And you probably are saying, why would you, why would you use any other network then? Uh, but the, Solana has gone through some growing pains. Uh, there's been a few outages uh, of, as of late. Uh, hopefully this is going to be some improvements of the, uh, with the team and the processes. Uh, but know that, you know, each network or each blockchain has its ups and downs. And Solana is definitely one that has some downtime as well. So there's other blockchains than these three. Uh, they each solve different use cases. So there's, for instance, there's things like Polkadot, uh, which allows us to achieve what we call blockchain interoperability. As you can probably imagine, all of these blockchains operate in essentially silos. They don't necessarily directly communicate with each other. So you can't have an asset or a wallet 
uh, on one Bitcoin and then directly transfer that over to Ethereum, for example. But there's been many people uh, in many efforts to try to improve this. So one of those is Polkadot, where you use a basically a chain, a blockchain of chains uh, that can connect and also communicate with each other. There's also things like Avalanche, which I've been focusing on doing things like sub networks or application specific blockchains, where one blockchain is addressing one specific application, let's say a game, for instance, that is powered by NFTs. And that also helps alleviate traffic and as well as uptime and gives better performance for that specific application. So there's also you know, been a growing area of these focus. So you'll probably see more in the future blockchains uh, addressing specific needs and specific use cases as Web3 grows. Now, I'm sure you're probably saying now that there's so many blockchains out there, you know, which is the best? Which one should I learn? Which one should I use? And to be honest, it, it really depends. Um, I'm not a maxi or what we call someone that only focuses on one specific blockchain. I think as we grow, as much like you wouldn't necessarily say there's only one database one person should use, I think these all these different blockchains will address different use cases. So it's worth exploring and at least knowing how they function. That's what this course is for. So I'll see you in the next one as we discover more about consensus models.